Join us each week for some booze-free banter about life without booze. If you're entertaining the idea of cutting back your booze by a day, a week, a month, or for the rest of your life, we would love for you to tune in. Buckle up and come along for a ride that may just change your life. Just a heads up, some of our conversations we have may be triggering for some. Reach out to your local resource support centre. If you're in Australia, that's Lifeline 131114. Psst, hey Meso. Psst, hey Breeza. Did you know that Altina is a non-elk wine built from botanicals and native Australian ingredients? It's also made right here in Australia. Oh, go Aussies! <laughs> and it was established by Christina DeLay and Alan Tuss in 2018, hence the name. Oh, the- Christina, yeah, and Alan, which I love it. Altina is such a cool name. Isn't it? Uh, together they have pioneered new methods to make delicious non alk wines and we love them. We really do. I cannot get enough of them. They're a great, great Australian brand doing great Australian things in the social outreach space. They not only produce a beautiful drink, but they also do great stuff in the community and they're supporting other local Australian businesses. We love Altina. Thank you. Thank you, Altina. Brisa, Meso. Hello, mate. How are you going today? Um, well, I'm a little bit nervy, Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, very. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so bit. today uh, we uh, we interviewed me last week, and now it's Brisa's turn. Yeah, and do you know what, mate? So I know you were nervous before your chat. I'm just thinking, oh, it's only, you know, you'll be fine. Let's chat about yourself. But now I get it. <laughs> I was like, geez, mate, so you're being a bit of a drama queen here. <laughs> and now you're peaking duck. <laughs> I am. It is. It's fully halftime change-ins and I'm full retro relaxo. Like I've just given the questions. I'm kicking back. I'm not even having to think about anything. Exactly how you were. Oh, I'm glad I know. to know you're a bit peaky. Mate, so, mate, I've done a couple of nervous poos this morning. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, listeners. No, regular. Good, good to know you're regular. Uh, well, Lisa is the maestro behind this whole podcast. Um, I don't know your story prior to us, I don't know, mixing it up in what we learned about our time together in London. Um, Brisa, you are uh, absolute, you hate the word guru, but I mean, <laughs> you are, you're a businesswoman, you're an absolute weapon in your field. Um, we're going to do deep dive into your previous roles in corporate. You're a mum of two. You're a stepmum of three. I know you don't love that step line, stepmum line. You're more of a, a, a positive role model to the kiddly winks. You've travelled extensively all over the world. Even as we've spoken throughout the pod, I'm like, oh, I didn't know you're in the Pilbara. I didn't know you went to Cape York. I didn't know you went to Like you've been, is there anywhere in the world that you haven't been? Um, and we've shared lots of yeah. like, boozy, hazy nights playing around the globe together as well. So, <laughs> Breeza. Here we go. We want to hear your story. I'm excited to hear it. The listeners are excited to hear it as well. Let's take us back. Firstly, we'll start with your shame story. You're going to have shame on me. Shame on me. Right, before I need to wet my whistle. Before we get into that. <laughs> because, again, the shame story I am about to share, May, so... Uh, I don't think that only one other person knows about it. <laughs> so it's a juicy one. Shit. It's a juicy one. It does come with a disclaimer. But before I do the disclaimer, I am going to crack my drink, which I'm drinking uh, Monday Distillery. So we're, we're still waiting for our postie to deliver our, our Tina. I know he's on the way. They're under the pump. <laughs> yeah, Christina's put it in the mail. I know that. So I actually purchased uh, the Monday Distillery's new brand a few weeks ago. It arrived this week. Mm-hmm. And the drink I'm having is a watermelon Paloma. Oh, now, I yes. love their, Have you had their Paloma, mate? I've, yes, I've been giving the um, Monday just really, really good touch up and their yes. grapefruity fresh Paloma, delish. Yeah. Watermelon, yeah. So they've got, they've got four new flavours. Get around them. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to, this is this is an exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> the <it>. scoop. <laughs> Seeing it right here, right now. All right, I've poured it into my glass. Let's have a yeah. little go. A little taste test. Ooh, fancy glass too. You really matched it oh, up. Oh, that's good. So this it's is like good. Watermelon Paloma, yum. I reckon a nice, maybe a mint leaf. Would mint Ooh, leaf. I like that. It. Mm. Nice with the garnish. Uh, recommend. Recommend. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I'm going I'm to match you with a pink as well. I, oh. I, 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 I've, I've kept a little sneaky stash while you're still waiting for the post. <laughs> 
<laughs> you always um, sneaky stash. I do. <laughs> I've got the old Tina, um, La- and, uh, Lovey and the Rose. Um, and do you hey. know what I'm drinking out, actually? This is just to mix it up because I went to a festival on the weekend. These are the cups you gave me for my birthday from Maxwell How Williams. Cute yes, keeps them nice and cold. Chilly Billy. All oh, right, enough about that. Let's get into it, Breeza. Okay, no, I am going to have a little disclaimer here because. Um, this story does involve drink driving and yeah and uh nobody got hurt nobody got injured nothing sinister happened thankfully we were lucky Mm. Mm. uh but i do want to put it out there because this could be triggering for some people um and so i do apologize ahead of time good call mate thank you so this would have been 2000 and i reckon 2010 ish maybe yeah 2010 2009-ish mark I will call it 2009 I was at a hen's party <laughs> I went to a hen's party so a typical hen's party story it was in a true car a true is about an hour north of my hometown Bendigo so the girls were rowdy we were up and about uh I went with a friend so we had we'd hide this little dodgy hotel for the night and yeah we just you know went nuts <laughs> went nuts <laughs> Had a real good, real good crack. And yeah, it was a fun night, really fun night. And then went back to a little dingy hotel and I woke up the next day, rolled over and there's Dim Sim next to me. Yeah, <laughs> steak or fried? Oh, fried, mate, fried. <laughs> <laughs> We're not messing around with um, the steam version. <laughs> but fried, fried, dirty dimmy straight from the Bay Marie. So I rolled over and I said to my friend, oh, did we get food on the way home last night? And she goes, Breezer. You got in your car and you drove us to the servo. Oh. And we got food from the Bay Marie and drove back to the hotel. Shit. I have no recollection of it. Ah. I couldn't, I tried to recall it. Like I was like, nah, it's gone. Don't remember anything. And I was blind, Meso. Like, Ah. para, I'd blacked out and I'd put myself my friend and everybody else on the road in danger. And I was like, oh, gosh, I wonder what the servo person thought. Like they would have seen us just roll out of the car. It would have been like the um, Wolf of Wall Street. You know how he gets out of the car? Yes. (laughs) It would have been like a horror scene like that. (laughs) And, yeah, like part of me hopes that he rang the police. Oh, bless. Like I think he would, wouldn't you, if you're a shop, if you're a servo person and you saw two girls roll out of it. I don't know. Maybe I parked. Maybe I did a Sneako park. <laughs> so I didn't know I'd driven. I don't know, mate. So I have no recollection. But the the I just that sinking feeling in my stomach. I still remember feeling that the next day going, I cannot believe I did that. And I still can't believe to this day I did it. Wow. The PFC. Yeah. S- switched off. Bad decisions. Oh really bad. And we were lucky. We were lucky. We're here to tell the story. We're not in jail. We haven't, you know, hurt ourselves or killed ourselves. But, oh, I just, it still gives me the heebie-jeebies thinking about it, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, thank you for sharing. I know that's a hard one and it's hard to reconcile to go, I I did that. That was me. Under the influence of alcohol and you think about obviously, yeah, you did get away with it. You did, no one was hurt or injured when many a people that hasn't been the case so yeah um may this be a lesson to everybody hey yep yeah yep 100 thank you for making oh, it easier for me yeah. to reconcile with me so yeah well you've told the story in, in hope that it will help others as well so yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks mate ouch Good hens party though. They're always just a rider fashion to get right off, aren't they? Oh, <laughs> just I take every- it to a next level. <laughs> Everyone knew in a chuka that we're in town. <laughs> I, I bet, I bet. Oh, thanks for sharing, mate. All right, Breeza, then take us back. When did booze first enter your world? So I'll take it back, May, so to I suppose growing up, like how I saw alcohol um, when I was a child. Um, yeah, like typical, I had a, I had a great childhood you know, was uh, brought up in a loving family, solid family, great parents, um, dad. There'd always be beer in the house. Like there's, there's always booze in the house, probably um, similar to a lot of, you know, Aussie households. Uh, dad was a tradie, so there'd always be, I remember there'd be slabs of Forex gold and oh. also Melbourne. He loved the Melbourne, Melbourne. cans. <laughs> yeah. And this was the 80s. Like yeah. Melbourne was big in the 80s. Um, so, yeah, I would just say he'd, he'd have knockoff, you know, knockoff beers. I never saw him drunk though. 
Yeah, right. I never, I never saw Dad drunk. Um, yeah. I do remember one time we left a AFL grand final party at a friend's house. Yeah. And, and I, th- I hope I get the story right, but I remember Dad and some of his friends had let ferrets out in one of their <laughs> friend's cars. <laughs> And looking back, I'm like, yeah, he was probably drunk then. But at the yeah. time, I just thought, oh, they're having a good time and that was it. Yeah. Um, I never saw mum drunk. Mum, you know, mum had the cast wine. She loved the cast wine. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. as kids, we'd always, like, put our finger on it and have a look of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, disgusting. <laughs> but mum, yeah, mum wasn't a big drinker. In fact, she never drank, like, when us kids were little. Yeah, right. Like, she never drank. It was only when we got older that she'd have a wine, you know, here and there. Um, yeah. So that was interesting, I thought, that she never drank whilst raising us children. Yeah. Um, next door neighbour, I've spoken about Daryl in, in uh, previous pods. He was the best next door neighbour ever and he'd come over with his home brew and him and dad would have, you know, have frothies together. So it was great. That was a great environment to be around. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, though, Meso, and this sort of goes into my story, mm. my grandma's dad was an alcoholic. Yeah, right. Yeah, so this would have been in the, she was born in 1927, so it would have been like 30s and 40s, the 1930s and 40s, like war, depression, all that. He was an alcoholic, but the way grandma describes him is that he was a happy drunk. Oh. <laughs> and I feel like, I feel like I was that yeah. happy drunk person. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, my relationship with booze uh, started, I reckon I was around 14, 15, May so, and I remember this incident. I and I started off been drinking. Like there was no just have a couple of cracks. It was like, bam, we're going straight to the heavy liquor, hard liquor. I went, I went to a friend's house for New Year's Eve. And then, um, yeah, and her parents happened to go out for the night. So we were like, green light, straight to the liquor cupboard. <laughs> like just disgusting Johnny Walker, like the most putrid. Oh, putrid. We were the same. We started on the same. <laughs> Like the brown putrid stuff. Ooh. And I remember that night, like, so I got drunk that night, mate. So I got drunk yeah. and I remember her dad came, her mum and dad came home <laughs> and I remember, and I'm not going to, I'm going to say his name is, we'll call him, I don't know, Gary. He walked in and he goes, g'day, Brianna. And I remember my <laughs> eyes rolling around in my head and I go, g'day, Gary. And I was trying to focus him. <laughs> and I just... I was no good. I was like, I'm so drunk. And then I remember that night we went to, uh, we went back to oh, uh, to my friend's bedroom where we slept for the night. And do you remember the ads? Um, uh, but wait, there's more. Those in- oh. all the knife ads. <laughs> yeah. I remember watching that on TV and just having this real moment with Tim. Was it Tim the knife man? Yeah, <laughs> it was Tim. Yeah, just having this real moment with Tim when I was drunk and yeah. just yeah, it was so bizarre. It was so bizarre. So I guess for me that. I feel like that set the scene for my drinking. Mm. And in fact, mum actually reminded me of a story because I had a chat to mum this morning. <laughs> hi, hi, Breezes, mum. <laughs> what a legend. Uh, hi, mum. And I had a chat to her this morning. She goes, oh, there was another time when I was about 15 or, 15 or 16 and I went to a party. I remember the guy's party it was at. It was a, a guy I went to school with. Mm. And mum said, not long after I had arrived at the party, I arrived home in a taxi and the taxi man had to go to the front door, knocked on, <laughs> knocked on mum and dad's door and said, I've got your daughter. Oh. So mum and my little sister had to get me out of the taxi <laughs> and put me to bed. And mum was like, you weren't at the party for long. And I remember the party well because remember, uh, uh, what are they called? Remember that song Peaches by United States of America? Um, United oh, yeah. Presidents. Peaches. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that song at the party. <laughs> So, yeah, and, yeah, I would say, safe to say my 20s was binge drinking, my 30s was also binge drinking, you know, Mm. yeah, finished high school, roll over to London, the partying really ramped up then, that's when we had some wild wild weekends (laughs) together. (laughs) And it just, yeah, there's always, you always find an excuse to drink. Yeah. I yes. also, I always found an excuse to drink, you know, yeah. come home from work or you catch up with a friend, any friend catch up. There was always, we'd have people over. There was always beer, wine, yeah. whatever it's, involved. And just married together. Every, totally. Just together, like peas and carrots. <laughs> yes. And it almost became my identity. I was almost like, I felt like out of the group of my friends, I was always the messy one. Yeah, right. always, It was always breezer. So I, I think a part of, like a part of me became that identity because of those expectations I had on myself. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand If, if we're going to yeah. sort of, yeah, do a deep dive into the psychology behind it, I think that's yeah. what it was is I just thought, well, I was, I was that messy, the messy drunk, and so I had to be that person every time. Yeah, which your friends really didn't, but you did. T- 
totally. That on yeah. 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 Hundred yeah. percent. That was yeah. that was me, in my own head. Yeah. So then, what did that drinking look like? Like you're saying, you had been drinking. Was it? We've spoken about we can only we can never really have one. Was it one or ten? Was there no off button? Could you ever only have one or a couple solo drinking? What did your drinking actually look like? So I feel like when I was in my twenties, there was there was no off button. Like there was yeah. just you, you go in hell for leather. Drink to uh, your drop. Drink to your drop. Yeah. When I matured and <laughs> <laughs> started drinking port. <laughs> And I matured and I, I, you know, at the time when I uh, sort of found an on-off button, <laughs> yeah. off button, it was when I was... <laughs> I was you know, Mine was broken. <laughs> had to get it fixed. Um, I, was, I was a mum of two and I was single at the time and I was becoming aware that every second weekend when I didn't have the kids, I was drinking and it wasn't a nice environment I was in like I was out in Bendigo at some you know I'm not going to name them but some yeah, you know I know, I know what you're yeah, talking about <laughs> some clubs and I just felt like I'll share a quick story with you mate so it was and this is when I found the off button and I went yeah. to this club and I looked around and everyone in there and there was a and I'm going to call it how it is there was a morbidly obese woman there Oops. And she used to go there quite a bit and she'd sit in her same spot. And, and I just like, when I was drunk, I'd probably just walk past her and high five her. Um, but <laughs> yeah. when I was, when I had my, you know, sober lens on, I just used to watch her and keep an eye on what was happening around her. And there'd be like these men, these unsavory men that would be oh. going up to her constantly. I don't know if they were buying her drinks. I don't know what their intentions were, but it made me feel uncomfortable. And, and I remember one night I saw her, she stood up, she had this, um, you know, this skirt on mm-hmm. underneath her skirt, she had pajama bottoms on and she was oh. wearing, she was wearing Crocs <laughs> and it just made me, I thought, I feel like she was a vulnerable person in society and I feel like she was ba- being taken advantage of. I could have mm-hmm. been totally wrong, but mm-hmm. seeing, her, seeing it through sober lens, mm-hmm. it just made me look at my whole surroundings in a different way. And it made me more aware that I need to be more aware of my surroundings when I'm blind drunk. Yeah. And when, you, when you're single, no one's looking after, like no one's got your back, Meso. And you, you've probably experienced that at times when mm. you've been single that you haven't got your wing, wing person there. Mm. You've got your mates, of course, but it's not that, it's not your, you know, one and only that's there to look after you. So you've got to look yeah. after yourself. Yeah. And that's probably where I discovered that I need to find the off button. For, wow. my own, for my own, my own safety and just for my own headspace as well. Mm. You don't want to wake up on your own the next day with shame and regret. It's awful. With a pair of Crocs in the cart. <laughs> <laughs> so then you discovered that off button. With that then, did you ever, in that time, did you ever question your drinking? Like how would you describe your relationship with booze? Well, because it was such over such a what a twenty five year career of drinking, <laughs> <laughs> solid <laughs> drinking. Um, I suppose what was the it was about me questioning it, wasn't it? Yeah. Did you ever question? Yeah. Drinking? Yeah. yeah. So I went through. So when I was, so I had a what, nearly two year old and a nine week old, mm. and so up until this point, there wasn't. I had not ever questioned my boozing and I was 32 at the time and I went through a marriage separation Mm. at that time. Yeah. And, um, you know, everyone's experience of marriage separation or relationship separation is, um, unique and different. For me, it was a very traumatic experience. Like, yeah, it was a really tough time in my life and, I know, and looking back, I know I used alcohol to cope. Mm. That was definitely a vice. And it was at that point when, and you know, I, I look back at those times, Mesa, and I, I remember distinctively feeling at, at a point my heart was physically aching. Like Oof. I felt this ache and no one wants to feel your heart aching. So of course you're going to, well, that was my answer it was drink, drink away that ache, drink away those feelings, drink away those thoughts. So mm. um, it wasn't until I was sort of, you know, getting past that really tough time that I did start questioning my relationship with alcohol mm. and you know, I, and that's when I realized that I was using booze as a coping mechanism and it's not a healthy relationship or healthy cycle to get into. Mm. But at the time I had permission, I gave myself permission and I feel like people around me with, they had the best interests in, 
my best, best interest. Like your best interest, their, yep. your best interest in their heart. <laughs> yes, that's your best interest, whatever it is. Yeah. You know. so, so their support looked like they were drinking with me, mm-hmm. they were coming over and, you know, they'd bring a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I remember a friend had said she came over on a, I don't know what night it was, but we, kids had gone to bed, my kids had gone to bed and, and this is when I was renting. So I, I had moved um, to my parents' house mm-hmm. and still breastfeeding. So, you know, I wasn't, I might have a glass of wine a night mm-hmm. um, over dinner. But then when I moved out into a rental and it was towards, I reckon my daughter was, I stopped breastfeeding around seven months. So there's a recipe for disaster. You're on your own and you're not breastfeeding yeah. <laughs> and you're going through a tough time. <laughs> the, the gates have just been open, animal out of a cage, off you go. That was exactly right. And mm. yeah, a friend, a friend had come over, we'll call it a Friday night and yeah, we were, I was just getting smashed and she, the next day she rang me and she goes, oh, just let you know, Breezer, I, um, I left at, I don't know, say 10.30 and because you'd pass out on the couch with a packet of Tim Tam <laughs> and I popped a blanket over you and oh. left. <laughs> and oh, so, bless her heart. I think, yeah, I think because, and I do this too, if someone's going through a bad time, I'll come over for a drink or I'll come over, we'll have a drink and we'll chew the fat. Yeah, so that's yeah. how, I, obviously my attitude has changed now, but that's what it was very much like that. Yeah. So I was just, yeah, I had permission to, you know, douse myself with booze, to mask my feelings, to drink. And I was, you know, it, it was like an excuse. I was just going through a tough time. Oh, I'm hungover today. I had a few, you know, a few wines and da-da. And mm. so, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't healthy. And, and going, getting to that cycle of having the kids every second weekend. Mm. And, and of course, like that's that, you know, release the pressure, drink. Yeah, that's what I was doing, and it wasn't actually until I met a friend, a beautiful friend. Hi, Jane, if you're listening, and Jane, Jane, Jane and I know she won't yeah. mind me saying this because mm-hmm. uh, normally we don't so we don't say names, but I know she won't mind. But she is not a big drinker, and I connected with her, and I was like, "Like, why are you getting blind drunk with me?" Like, <laughs> yeah. So I feel like I made her drink more, and she made me drink less. So we sort, yeah. of, met, sort of met in the middle. Um, so yeah, I think it was it was. Uh, you know, probably five or six years ago is when I started to question it and I started to become sober curious. Mm. I read some, I read some books. I had seven months, I shouldn't say seven months sober because I wasn't sober, but I did a seven month stint where I, where I drove. So if I was going to a function, I drove. Um, And the catalyst was that is just, it was just because I feel like, yeah, that whole, I was on my own. I was single. It was a safety thing. It was awareness thing. Yeah. So what sort of, just to go back with that time frame period of when, and I'm so sorry about the, the marriage breaking down, from that point to when you decided, oh, I'm going to question my drinking, what sort of time frame was that? Oh, months, you, years? Yeah, you'd be talking four to five years. Gee, yeah, four to five that's years. a long time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a long time. And knowing that I was, you know, I, and I was, and I'm not going to share my ex's story, but those who in my inner sanctum know, but mm. I was also watching someone that I loved in a really difficult, going through a really difficult time. Mm. So I know that I was hands down using booze throughout those five years to cope, to yeah. cope and to, to life and to get through and to mask emotions. Like, yes. oh, emotion pops up. Give me some wine. Yeah. <laughs> Self-medicate that. Put a Band-Aid on and it comes in. The, yeah. Put a Band-Aid in a bottle. Band-Aid in a bottle. That's gold, mate, <laughs> I like that. Have it. Now, one thing you said to me in the last episode, you're really surprised that I get um, hangovers and anxiety. You were, And I was surprised you did too because I'm like, no, nah, she's got it together. I didn't know that you woke up every morning. Tell us about that. Tell us about your hangovers. How bad were they in anxiety? Yeah, so hangovers, so anxiety I wasn't really aware of until it was sort of labelled as something. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I remember, like, hangovers, how bad are they (sighs) as you get older? I I actually quite enjoyed eating all the trash, like just being (laughs) an absolute slob and disgusting human being because it was an excuse to do that because you were never like that normally because you're always prim and proper (laughs) and polished. Absolutely. And I was, I was very similar, but um, it was funny actually looking back throughout my pregnancies, Mm. like I felt, and this does go back to hangovers. I felt 
so healthy in my pregnancies. I had, I was fortunate to have two really great pregnancies and I was like, I feel so good. Like I just, you know, I'm just glowing. I was <laughs> loving life. And it wasn't until I look back, I'm like, you were feeling great because you weren't drinking and you weren't getting hungover and you weren't just being a sloth to society. <laughs> like, it was literally because, um, yeah, I wasn't drinking, but fu- funnily enough, the minute I had my kids in hospital, I was ordering Fosters on the, on the <laughs> hospital menu. Cans. <laughs> the big blue cans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, but hangovers, yeah, had some shocking hangovers. And mm. one of the ones that sticks in my mind that happened last year, oh. is, I don't know if I've said this on the potty, I had a, um, had a lock-in at a pub. <laughs> and yeah, it started off just by having after work drinks oh. uh, with a colleague, with yeah, one, mm. a staff member. And then, mm. yeah, Breeza gets home at 1.30 and <laughs> had been darting behind the bar. Fun. I was running the show. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, May, so the hangover was horrendous. So this, yeah, this is last year, 2021. What's well, 41? I was actually 40 at the time. And I, yeah, just got out of bed, went and drove, it had a massage, worst thing I could have done, got home, went to bed and then got up, laid in the shower, went back to bed till five o'clock in the afternoon and then got out of bed and had takeaway, went back to bed. So what sort of, like, that's just such a waste of a day, isn't it? Such a waste. waste. I've done it for years. Yep. Could you sleep with your hungover though? I could never sleep hungover. No, when I look back, especially in my 30s, in my 20s more so I would say, that you'd wake up and you'd feel crook. You'd go to the toilet, have a drink of water, go to bed, be niggly. You'd just be niggly, I reckon. Yeah, couldn't concentrate on it, like couldn't watch a movie or anything. Just yeah, like, you just didn't know what you wanted Yeah, type thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, hangovers were bad, but you would, you'd would you often just push through them. Mm. But, but I think the biggest uh, wake-up call for me is, is the fact that when I didn't have the kids, so every second weekend I didn't have them, and I would want to make the most of those 48 hours. Mm. And a hangover was getting in the way of that. So the five hours of boozing would then result in eight hours of wastage. Yeah. So I was like, this is, this is, I've got to weigh things up here because my hangovers are getting in the way of my life. Yeah. Um, the anxiety thing for me, it was, um, the heart racing. Right. Yeah. That was, that was a big thing. And that was only came on, I reckon in my forties, maybe. Right. So I didn't have, yeah, I reckon in my maybe late, thir- maybe late thirties, I'd say forties is that I get that heart racing thing. Yeah. And then sometimes on a Sunday I text my <laughs> therapist. <laughs> and I'd, be like, I'd be like, such and such, um, yeah. had a big night last night. Don't remember getting home. And she'd be like, did anyone die? Did anyone get hurt? Did anyone die? They were her first two things to talk me off the ledge. And I'd be it. like, I'd be like, no. And she'd be like, um, and I'd be like, I don't know what I said. She's like, you probably just talked about yourself because that's what <laughs> drunk people do. And I'm like, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely had, and that probably happened, I don't know, a handful of times where I was like panic at the disco the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would often, there's a couple of times I remember I just, look on social media t- for good things that would make me feel good. Right. To try and pet me, pet me up. But yeah, bit of joy. I mean, you spend time on social media and it probably gets you down into a deep hole. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I purposely seek out accounts that I know would make me feel good. Yeah. That yeah. was nice by you and you didn't even realise that that was happening, that you needed to. Mm-hmm. Now you're well ahead of it. To- like, did totally. You, did you have that remorse, shame, regret, what did I say, what did I do? All of it. Like, yep. Was I carrying on like a pork chop? Was I an asshole? Did I make a dick of myself? Was I, you know, mooning any? I wasn't mooning anyone. <laughs> that was in my 20s. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, just what was I like when I was drunk? And because, and you do, like, to be fair, you do forget that other people are drunk around you. So they're mm. not co- kind of, well, they're sober people, but then you sort of think, oh, well, people are too drunk to notice anyway. Yeah. And that's actually one thing I do now when I'm sober. I'm like, people aren't going to care if I'm dancing sober because they're drunk anyway. Yeah. So it's a good yeah. feeling. It's actually a good feeling when you're like, don't care because you think these people aren't going to remember it. Yes. And, and funny, I had a conversation uh, with someone at Red Hot Summer Tour a few weeks ago and I saw them last week and she doesn't remember seeing me. <gasps> oh. And she said stuff to me. <laughs> Oh, but clearly she doesn't remember saying she sort of spilled oh. her, spilled her guts about some stuff. And Damn. I was like, oh, 
she doesn't remember that, the Books. poor thing. And I just felt sorry. I felt, oh, I just thought, oh, she doesn't feel, she doesn't remember saying that. Yeah. Um, and it took me back to, took me back to what I would be like, what I, yeah. what I would feel like when, yeah. Um, yeah, when I was, I'd said something or done something when I was drunk and I don't remember it. And then people remind you, don't be that person, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> do, <laughs> let it go. Do that person go, oh, do you remember when, oh, and you did this, oh, just don't be that person. Cause the person that you're saying it to, and this was me, I was getting it top, getting told, you know, oh, you did this, did that. You're like, oh, you just brush it off. But inside mm-hmm. you're like, go on, shh. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much and then you go home and you do your heading over it and yeah. you're just like mm. if you're going to be that person pull that person that person aside and say hey just want to let you know this is what you did last night mate yeah yeah because just... i and i i don't think and i hope i haven't ever been that person to go oh my god you should have seen what you did last night like yeah. because i know what it's like to be on the receiving end of that and it's not a nice feeling yeah the only times I would do that is I go, you are the funniest person in the world. You were on fire last night. Like, love your moves. Like, you are, you know, I'd be pumping people. And that's time. totally good. Right. That's totally fine. Okay. Um, just going back on what you're saying, my mum has this little saying about people are more worried about what they look like than to what you worry about what you look like. So when you think about everyone being yeah. drunk and about what, whether you offended someone, everyone else at home is doing the same thing, hung over and worrying about themselves. So they're yeah. not even worrying about you. So it's to- yes, yeah. and that's another thing that... My dear therapist says like, <laughs> people are too worried about themselves and what they did mm, than worrying mm. about you. So you Correct. do you do do your head in. And I think towards my, you know, the end of my drinking career, that kept popping up more and more. Yeah. That what did I say? What did I do? And thankfully my partner is super, he's super reassuring. Oh, go, um, go doc. Yeah, he would always reassure me um, yeah. and just say you're funny and you're fine and da da da. Yeah. But it was those moments when I was on my own, especially you know five six years ago, mm. where I would just do my head in. Yeah, it's the worst feeling in it's, the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then you sit there and go, oh, I'm never going to drink again. Come Friday <laughs> night. Yeah, <laughs> had a had a had a big had a big big week at work. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing. Getting back to the safety thing is, mm. you know, I, I live ten minute taxi drive or uber drive from the main center of town mm. so getting is like and i know how drunk i'd get so i know that <laughs> i wouldn't be remembering the walk out of the nightclub to the taxi rank and the ride home i just wouldn't remember that stuff so putting yeah. yourself in that danger as well started to make me feel uncomfortable because stuff happens like mm. even though we're in a country town well you know it's a regional city mm. bad stuff still happens to good people yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I think when you reflect, it's because you're a good person, you care, you've got a conscience. Like if you're working up the next day and not giving a f- shit about what your behaviour, what you did, probably yeah. a bit of an arsehole, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that goes back to, you know, how the way I was how the way I was brought up. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, but um, it was interesting when I've been chatting to mum about uh, you know, at the potty, and she does listen to every episode, which I love. Love that. Um, she did say to me that she my shame stories do make her feel a bit uncomfortable Aww. because ultimately it's like she's raised me, yeah. but I'm like, mum, that's no reflection on you. Like I have treaded my own path. I've got two other sisters. They're not, they weren't blind messes like me. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> I think that's just my personality and, you know, and it's interesting, isn't it interesting, May? So like you look back at your family tree mm. and my great grandpa was an alcoholic Yep. And he was a happy drunk. And yeah. I look at me, I go, I, well, I'm a happy drunk. Like I'm that affectionate, affectionate person. Like I do, uh, as we've spoken about, I do give people spray every now and then, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I instigate it. I feel like it gets, I get sort of, you know, pushed a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Poke the bear. <laughs> yes. but yeah, like I, and I am happy that I was a happy drunk mm-hmm. as well. Like it softens the blow a little bit. Yeah, Yeah, it's true. And you are that. Like when I think about you and the group of friends, I'm like, yes, Breeze is here. She's up and about. She's fun. There's never any trouble with her. We're just always on fire. A bit of a menace. Yeah, like like, just a bit cheeky, playful, fun, up for a dance, boogie, up for anything. Like it's always, yeah. yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and even being a parent now, like, and just as we're on this learning journey, no one's immune to alcoholism. No one's immune to mm. addiction. No one's, you know, immune to these things. It's not like, yeah, it, they do happen. And unfortunately, it's out of the control of the parents. Yes. Just on that, so when I was talking to mum the other day and we were talking about how I pushed the boundary so much mm. when I was a teenager mm. and they'd spoken to the school psychologists and stuff and said, 
you know, she does. She's adventurous and wants to push the boundaries and wants to explore that her par- what your parents are saying may not always be the way. Yep. Which- they want... So yeah, so it's you know, and I uh, God bless our parents. They brought them up, but bought, they've brought us up so brilliantly, and we we do fall into everything that they've taught us and rounded us to be good yep. human beings. But you know, we've challenged the, yep. the status quo, which is yeah. great. It makes the world evolve. It makes you know, yeah. you know, look, it makes technology, makes everything evolve. If yeah. we don't, if we didn't push the boundaries, then yeah, you know, the world's not going We'd to be grow. A bit beige, wouldn't we? We'd be a bit beige. <laughs> Would, no one would evolve and no one would grow and learn. Exactly. Um, and, I, and, and it does excite me and scare me to think what, it's, what the world is going to be like and how my kids are going to be when they are. Like my son is 10 mm-hmm. this year. He's like four to five years off boozing. <laughs> <laughs> like even my... Wish those like, AF drinks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. And I love that they are becoming aware. I love that they're aware now. Mm -hmm. And we have some really open, honest chats. And I do talk about when mum was drunk. And so they are being educated as well so that they will have these, you know, these little tidbits of information to help Mm -hmm. them make decisions um, when they're old enough. That's brilliant, Breeza. Exactly. What we didn't have when we were kids, because there was no other option, either drink or you didn't. Well, you didn't not drink. Yeah. And I think like my parents did protect me from alcohol like yeah. they weren't you know having mad sessions in front of me and you know what when I would see dad drinking at the table he was just it was just a, a, be- a beer with dinner there yeah, was nothing right. more nothing more to it it was just a beer at dinner wasn't knocking back the long necks <laughs> yeah it wasn't knocking back the long it wasn't like on the couch yeah knocking back a VB long neck he, like, he's recline, <laughs> recliner watching the footy classic <laughs> so Breeza you are a super social butterfly and in your um work spaces you've hosted clients and events and you've got a huge circle of friends and you know you love a really good party so I'm calling you know how it's like before Christ and after Christ <laughs> so it's AC or um what is it before Christ BC or after Christ is AC so yeah. it's BB so um B, with B, oh hang on what is it big big bit <laughs> Uh, after alcohol, around. before after alcohol, before alcohol. Yeah. So A A A A A. So B uh, B A before B-A, alcohol, before alcohol, or with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you'll get what I'm talking about. So yeah, how is it now? Like, how oh, is it now? I like legitimately, may so. It was something that did scare me to go. How am I going to socialize? How am I going to network mm. uh, without? booze, mm. but I have just got this overwhelming new sense of confidence. Yes. Um, and yeah. And actually a few weeks ago, uh, I was at a wedding and yeah, everyone knew that I wasn't drinking and it wasn't even a thing. Like I was drinking my AF um, champagne. Mm. And in fact, um, one of my cousins had said to his wife, oh, look, she's drinking. And she was like, no, she's not. That's her alcohol-free <laughs> <laughs> champagne or bubbles. Uh, and so, yeah, and like just I think the confidence comes from knowing that you are in control, even though we used to love get out of, out of control, <laughs> yeah. but knowing that you're in control, I can like I actually love dancing sober. Yeah, wow. Because I do it at home, eh? so I do it at home. So why is it different to then doing it out in public? Mm. And when you're around, and I found this, the more the more I've gone, the more I've socialised with uh, drunk people. When you're around drunk people, they do get you you up and about. Yeah, yeah. Like they do get you up dancing. They do get you up singing. And so I love being lifted and just joining with them. I love it. <laughs> It might not necessarily be me meet leading the way anymore, yeah. but I am. I'm still there amongst it. You're still part so, of it. Yeah. So it did. So for anyone who is listening, and and it does scare the crap out of them. And even actually, I heard at the wedding, some girl, some girl was on the dance floor. She's like, "I'm not drunk enough to dance yet." And oh. I used to, I used to be like that, May. So yeah, at yeah. I had a few more drinks before I hit the dance floor. Mm. But yeah, for, for our listeners, it it is it is possible. And it, the more you do it, the more it's like that flexing your muscle. Yeah. The easier, the better, and even the better it feels. Yes. And there's no like, there's no, uh, those, what do we call it? Those cartwheel, mental cartwheels. Yes. The, gymnastics, the, mental gymnastics. Yeah, mental gymnastics in your head going, I need mm. another drink. If I have three, try three drinks, then I can dance. Yeah. Or I can't have more than 10 drinks tonight because I don't want to get too drunk because I've got something on tomorrow. You don't have any of that. So you've just got this, you've got more space in your head for creativity yeah. um, and for just for more thinking. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, and I, the other thing too is I feel more confident approaching people when I'm not drinking because I'm not going to go, oh my God, are you going to say something? Are you yeah. something? <laughs> or have I spoken to you last time? I can't remember the yeah. conversation from last time. Totally. Yes. So you almost feel like you do have this upper hand. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's like the smug, the smug girls, smug AF cocktails. You do feel a bit smug mm. when you know that you're going to an event, you're going to be your true self. Mm. You're not going to be saying something offending anybody. You're not going to be, you know, waking up the next day with shame and regret. Mm. So you do, it does, all that combined gives you this whole sense of confidence. Yes, she's firing and that's so infectious. Like I can see you're just pumped. It's like this new life that you've got, isn't it, that you've created for yourself. So you yeah. spoke about earlier about um, coping and using alcohol to cope then. Mm. Were you just dousing booze down your neck to try and make the pain go away quick how I used to? And then how are you coping moving through oh. those feelings now? Yeah, what a great question. Like? Eh? So, so <laughs> I, I would say in those in that traumatic time, and I'm calling it trauma, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm putting it, I'm putting it on record. It, it is, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. It was, it was uh, traumatic. So, yes, I was, I was definitely using it. I was, yeah, that was my little reward at the end of the day when, when you know, put the kids to bed. It was something I looked forward to, and then it was my r- release on the weekends when I didn't have the kids. Mm. So, yeah, legitimately. That's how I was getting through. And at that time, I started a small, started my business up as well. So there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And I also gave myself permission to, when you're doing, you know, work at night, you can have a glass of wine as well. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. If any of my clients are listening, I don't do that. Um, <laughs> and I was, never, I was never drunk. Don't worry, I was never drunk doing it. Uh, but, I, but I had given myself permission for that. So now, and this is something that you don't read. I don't feel like there's um, a lot of awareness or maybe I just didn't. Maybe I just ignored the awareness that was out there. But when you don't drink, you do feel every bloody effing emotion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. Mm-hmm. And But, boy, it's so good to get over because I don't last forever. No. Nope. You're feeling like, you know, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling angry, you're feeling sad, upset, you're feeling happy, whatever emotion you're feeling, mm. you get to feel it all. And it's okay to cry. Like I might cry spontaneously. (laughs) (laughs) And that's okay. I do it. I don't do it out out in public. So it's it's safe to go out with me. I'm not going to just burst out crying. (laughs) (laughs) But I've just learned to, and the more I do read stuff on Instagram and stuff and about sitting in your emotions and yeah, you can't escape them. And at times it does you nothing, Mm. but as you get through them, and it's interesting, May, so in conversations I've heard mm. with people, uh, they've, you know, they've been off the gas. Well, they've had, you know, might've been not drinking for the week and then something happens and it triggers them. And this is what I used to do as well. Something happens and you go, oh, I'm going to drink. Do you, you just, just throw the towel that? in. Yeah. yeah. Go, go. I, I, sometimes I'd look for an excuse. Oh, hell yeah. Like yeah. if I'm like, you know, sober, sober, sober. Mm. And then I'd be like, oh, good. That'll be, yep. That's ticked me off. That's razzed me up. Yeah. I get to drink now. Do you and know what I mean? Be, could be that you spill cereal on the floor. Yeah. It could be something. Just so, something Someone's so walking minute. in front of you in the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's it's true. true. It's true. Yeah. So how are you getting through those emotions now? I know we've touched oh, mate, so I'm really curious to know. Where you um, phone calls to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, and I, I don't do it enough, but journaling, I, don't, I, don't, I know I don't do it enough. Um, I honestly have found this podcast to be really a, a helpful tool mm-hmm. um, just to, I don't know, just to see the, uh, I don't know, just to reiterate, just to help me re- reiterate that uh, life without booze is working for me. Yes. Because it is easy to have those things creep back in your head. And you know what? Going to parties, weddings, all that, I can handle. I can do that. I know I can. But it's the, it's the emotions, which yeah. is, again, I was using it as a coping mechanism. So to get through them, I, you know, I've been, and I'll, I've been a bit funny about this, but and I, in pre- previous podcasts, I call her my mentor, but she's my, she's my therapist. <laughs> Shout out. Shout out. Um, and she, like, I've been seeing her for golly gosh, eight years. Yeah. And I'm at a point now where I just have a little, have a little zap, have a little check in with her. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, obviously family and friends are, are, are great to having that inner sanctum, but there's also that 
other third party, if I, if I call her that. Mm. She's the, you know, she's got the tools that I need. Um, mm. She helps me, you know, get things off my chest. But yeah, so that's that's been a big thing for me is therapy, I, and I'm a huge advocate of it. Um, Same. It's, it's, it's helped me. It's really yeah. helped me. Everyone should go to therapy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a it's an amazing tool. Like oh, I actually saw your mentor. Yes. Today. <laughs> Yeah. And she's brilliant. She's amazing. So, she, yeah, couldn't and, recommend it more highly. And I found, uh, you know, you might see a therapist, doesn't work for you, try another one. Mm. You've yeah. Got to, you've got to find one that really, fits. yep, that really fits. Yes, yeah, shop so, around. Yeah, shop around. So I think, yeah, the, the whole emotion thing is, we're working through those emotions is focusing on self-care as mm. well. So it's okay to sit on the couch and do nothing. Um, yep. It's okay to say no to, you know, to an event. Mm. Uh, it's it's okay if you have a cry at night time. It's you've just got to give yourself permission to um, to do whatever you need to do to get through those emotions. Yeah. But and actually at that Schwader event that I went to I don't know, about, about a month ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he one of his questions to the audience was who looks after their who does self care? And I put my hand up and mm. and he said to people what what made you do self the self care routine that you do? And I wish I had to put my hand, I wish I had have spoken about it, but at the time I was like, oh, I'm on the spot. Um, but looking back, what triggered me to sort of, you know, focus on my self-care was when I went through a major separation, I had two options. The first one was to swim. Second one was to sink. Wow. Swim for me looked like getting on with life and, you know, being the best mum I could and getting on with what the task at hand. Mm. Sinking to me looked like, throwing in the towel and crumbling and needing support. And I'm a bit of a proud person. So I, <laughs> I took, and I look, I didn't do it alone. I did ha- definitely have a lot of love and support around me, but I took the swim option. And part of that option was to go and see a therapist. Part of that option was to drink a lot of booze <laughs> <laughs> at the time, at the time. Um, but obviously now my self-care is not to drink booze. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, that self-care routine is, and which helps with those emotions is to, you know, journal when I can, when I, when I think of it, is to do my Pilates in the morning when I get out of bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we all know what we need to do. Yeah. I, well, I feel like I, I know what I need to do. I know what ticks my boxes. I know what gets me in a great headspace. Mm-hmm. And I might do some of those things once a week. I might yeah. do some of those things once a month. Mm-hmm. So I, I know what I need to do. And thankfully, I now know that I don't need alcohol. Yes, to, oh, to handle emotions. Love this, love this. It's, it's, it's and it's huge. I think people underestimate. Like Greg spoke about it in his potty, booze free mm, dad. Mm. It's tough. It's it really is tough. Really tough. And when you're going through something really tough, and you don't have that booze, it kind of exacerbates the entire situation. It doesn't make it easier. You're dealing with, oh, I don't have my normal crutch of run, you know, grabbing a bit, mm. grabbing a drink. So mm. you kind of dealing with two problems but when you get through it you you don't have as many like it's a it's a really proud time to go I got through it through that without booze and I'm doing this yeah incredible. and it does it's really liberating yeah and it just puts you in a clearer headspace and in fact I had a friend he went through a marriage separation how many years ago and he consciously chose to watch what he was drinking because he knew he had to have a clear mind to get through it wow how how insightful how yeah. insightful yeah. whereas I was the opposite but I, I look back now it got me through and that's all I knew at the time yep. um, yeah um I did what I did the best I could at the time yep. but I'm thankful now that I've I know that's not the best thing for me yes love that I love that quote quote <laughs> we've got to, we got to quote in quote in the pod yes so then when and what what and when was the defining moment that brought on that decision to remove booze from your life, what was that? Another cracking question, Maso. Yeah. So I can tell you the exact day, time, everything. Yes, <laughs> paint a picture. It was June 14, it was a Monday, and uh, I had been, it was a long weekend last in 2021, long weekend. I'd been down the beach with friends. So it was me and the kids and her and her husband and the kids, and We'd kept a lid on it on the Friday and Saturday were pretty good. On the Sunday, wine to our bang. We're on, we're on here. We're on here, people. Are you, are you normally always half cut when you rock up to a winery anyway? Well, you know what? I was like, we, we doled ourselves up, me and my friend, and we're like, yeah. we had the kids in tow, so yeah. we couldn't really rip the lid off too early. But um, so, And we had a nice lunch and everything. And But I was, I was up and about. 
And so we went to a couple of wineries and then went back to the house and then that's when it was game on back then. Yeah. So game on. I've actually got a bloody, oh, we were doing all sorts of stuff. You can imagine, me. So there was <laughs> dancing, gymnastics, sports acrobatics. There was, there was all going on. <laughs> interpretive dancing as well you love that (laughs) and I went to bed um so my friend's husband he was he was semi-sober so he sort of had he sort of had the kids looking after the kids Mm -hmm. went to bed woke up the next day and I had this sinking feeling in in my stomach going I didn't I don't remember putting the kids to bed I didn't say goodnight to my kids last night I didn't tuck them in I didn't make them feel safe you're the shittest mama shittest mama (laughs) (laughs) You're the shittest mum. Um, yeah, I just had this, oh, that's just shit ass. And I probably woke up a bit anxious actually. Like I had the heart racing and I was, yeah, my friend was like, I feel good today because we are both sort of like we don't want to have a big night, but, yeah, we got carried away. She was feeling okay. I was like, yeah, I feel okay too. Then driving back that day, I was just dreading the week ahead. I had a huge week mm. and I was just like, something's got to give. So I thought I was the only person in the world to start questioning my alcohol relationship oh, with alcohol. Yes. Legitimately, I didn't, I didn't know life without alcohol was a thing, L- like literally. Did not know that people were doing this bizarre thing. Yeah. So on the, uh, must have been on the Tuesday. So that was on the Monday, the 14th, when I woke up. On the Tuesday, got on my um, Pilates machine, jumped onto my podcast app, started searching for podcasts, typed in the word sober. First podcast that came up was Sober Awkward. And I just was like, oh my God, these girls are me. Like they're, they were massive booze hounds and they're not drinking. And oh my God, they're saying how good life is without booze. Like what the heck, who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> and that really started this whole um, um, obsession. I'm going to call it an obsession mm-hmm. with uh, getting to learn about and educating about life without alcohol and, and actually living it and breathing it. And bloody hell, I just, eyes wide open. Yeah. Was it hard? Did you find that little first little bit difficult? I didn't tell anyone. Like, I think you're the first person, Mesa, when I was about, oh, when I was six weeks. I feel really privileged because, with that. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks for listening and thanks for being so, you were so excited for me. You were really mm-hmm. cheering me on. But I felt like I didn't want to tell anybody else because it was just so foreign to me still. Yes, yes. Yes, so, well, yeah. I felt like that when I was dipping my toe back into sobriety. So after you told me, I didn't want to tell you that I was. Oh, there you go. Like, yeah, I wanted to tell you a few times. I thought, I don't want to tell her if I fail. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it was really interesting. I know you want to keep it to yourself. And also because yeah. there's pushback. People don't get it. We People don't get, get it. it. Like, oh, God, no. I didn't know, get it. A couple of years ago, if someone said to us, I'm going sober, we're like, <laughs> what do you want to do that for? Yeah, why? Like, yeah, why? why? You? Boring. Yeah. And, yeah, it wasn't till so that was in the June and I reckon in the July, that's when I also discovered this whole new thing called alcohol-free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, these are incredible. And I still, to this day, they have, hands down, kept me on track. Yeah, unreal. So much so that you have. Tell us about starting yeah. the Sober Aussie Mum, I Flaunt, then the podcast and Wet Your Whistle. Have, have you, yeah. Morgan, how did that all come into your life and what's your vision with all of that, Breeze? Like you've yeah. taken off with this. It's like it's been only a short time that you're a rocket. <laughs> oh, thanks, Faye. So yes. that's, that's really kind of you to say that because, mm. you know, imposter syndrome, you don't feel like that. I think oh. we've, all, we've, all got a, we've all got a bit of that. But, yeah, I started the Instagram account, May, so purely under the radar. I was like, I need to connect with his, with like-minded people on Instagram just because I was just still that educating myself phase and I still needed, you know, things in my tool belt to keep me on track. So mm. I, yeah, just deep dived into Insta, started Sober Aussie Mum because I'm like, well, that's that's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> real Bogan. I thought, well, go real Bogan. Yeah, go no Bogan. No one's going to know it was me and I was really strategic. I wouldn't put posts up of myself. And then I put a photo of myself. I'm like, oh, my God, someone's going to say that. <laughs> and, like, I was kind of mysterious, Sober Aussie Mum. Mm. And then I... What happened? I think then I then I was like, you know what? I don't want to. Pi- I just didn't want to pigeonhole myself into because that. And it, we're we're going to talk about this in upcoming episodes. That whole word, whole world, whole word, sober. Yeah, so, sober word. It still wasn't really in my vocabulary. I wasn't comfortable with it, and so I was like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself into that. 
category, rightly or wrongly. Yeah. And because I was so into these alcohol-free drinks, I'm like, cool, take the focus off me. Let's focus on the alcohol-free drinks. Yeah. So, and we all know that social media works. People love hearing the personal story. But I'm like, nope, you're getting the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> But it did, it did blow up. So I changed my name to iFlaunt AF Drinks. Mm. And then it did blow up when ABC contacted me and wanted to run a piece about alcohol-free drinks, which actually turned into more of a piece about me. Mm. And then that's when it blew up. People connect, you know, people were messaging me. I, I had radio stations contacting me. I loved it. Like, it was great. I love all that stuff. <laughs> so. Same. And you, you're such a pro at it. Like, you are really a profession. Oh. You can actually um, see and hear those articles on Booze Free Bands. Oh, sorry, at Booze Free Bands. You can see it in our little link. Literally, and it's on our wall as well. You can see Breeze's article and yeah. the radio. It's so good. You're bloody it's so I good. I, I had a friend of a friend. He was driving his header because mm. it was harvesting season. Mm. And, yeah, he said to my friend, oh, I was just, you know, listening to the cricket next to me and Breezer pops up on ABC <laughs> radio talking about alcohol free drinks. <laughs> so I just love and, it. And I think, you know, the warm and fuzzies I get from people who contact me and they contact mm. um, us on Booth Three Band and they say, you're helping me. You've made me start, you know, quiz questioning or looking into my relationship with alcohol. And I was mm. like, that is so cool. Like that's, I didn't know that was going to be a thing that came from this. Yes. Yes. And it has. So I just suppose I look at myself as like, I am, you know, a common person. I was a binge drinker. I found this new way of living. I want other people to know it's possible as well because yes. I felt so many benefits from it. So that sort of rolled into, you know, getting into front of workplaces, having, you know, background in corporate and background in small business owner. I was like, there's an appetite for this. And I do want to be that person to go into workplaces and to educate them and to tell them that there's another option parts from booze and you're relatable breezer like people oh, get thanks, it mate. Like you, you're warm you're welcoming people get it you're intriguing you're engaging fun you know you're the perfect person for the and, job and i feel like nothing shocks me i've, I've and i've done it all i feel like i've done like, i've done a lot of partying as you know <laughs> yeah. me so like, yeah. I've, I've experimented <laughs> I, I feel like you know my 20s was a great time to do all that to get mm. all that out of my system experiment just run an absolute mark and i have no regret from that like i'm glad i've lived that life Mm. Got myself in probably some pretty uncomfortable situations <laughs> at times. <laughs> bit dicey. <laughs> bit dicey. <laughs> but I feel like that's what makes the person that, you know, that I am today. Yeah. yeah. Um, and right. so nothing, nothing shocks me. Yes. Nothing, you know. You're definitely We're all human. Not, the exactly. Day. You're not straighty 180. <laughs> no. And I want that. Like I want my kids to go and explore and experiment with life. Yeah. Like I just hope they find a stop button before yeah. I do. <laughs> Better get the tech in. <laughs> I just want to ask as, as well because you messaged me said we're doing a podcast. It's called Booze Free Advance. Mm. You're my co-host. Tell us how that. <laughs> tell us where that was born. Well, I think because we had been chatting, May. So when we did our like little sessions for um, our social media sessions together. Yeah. I just like we do our business chat and then we were just we were just bantering on. Like we were just chatting <laughs> and we'll just we just we had so much in common in this space. I was mm. like, Meso is on, we're on the same wavelength with this. Mm. And there wasn't like there wasn't a lot of sober podcasts, there wasn't a lot of podcasts out there. There's some cracking ones, mm. but I feel like in Australia yeah. there wasn't there's room. There's, there's room for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you know what? We can bring something different to the table here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we can. Yes, yes we, we are. <laughs> yes. And so I've always wanted to do a potty for the last two years. I actually started one called Bendigo and Beyond, which uh, I had a little jingle for it. I love my, love my little jingle I had for it. I got a, a local guy, Will Edwards, to do a little jingle for it. And I just I interviewed two people. I had two potties ready to go, just never got off the ground. And I think maybe doing it with somebody else, I just love that we're in this together as well. Yeah, it's pretty, it gets you real up and about, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> It's like stuff. And I had all the gear. Like I bought all this gear, I don't know, five years ago. I bought all the gear, all the gear, no idea. I was like, nah, stuff it. I'm, I'm, we, we're going to do it. And I'm so glad that you agreed, May. So thank you for, oh. thank you for being so, in, like you were, you were like, yep, all right, let's do it. Like within a week, you were like, right, I, like, whereas I'd be like, I had this other podcast sitting, you know, in, in um, idling for two years because I just didn't do it. But you were just like a bull at a gate. You're like, come on, let's do this. All right, what do we need to do? What are we meeting? What are we talking about? Da-da-da. So you, you were really the driving force to get get my idea out of my head oh. onto onto like into people's ear holes. I'm 
still do remember the first episode. We're like hit record and I was like, okay, go. What are we doing? <laughs> we're just like, and you're in the car. <laughs> yeah, it was in the car. So look how far oh, we've come, Mason. I know. It's been, honestly, from my heart, bottom of my heart, thank you for inviting <laughs> me on and trusting me with this project. It has been a bloody dream. I've learned so much. Anyway, this isn't about me, but you have, you've driven this so, Breeza. You do so much work behind the scenes with, you know, organising sponsors and producer and there's so much that goes on behind. People don't understand how big a job it is to actually yep. put a podcast together and you are the driving force behind that. So without you, this wouldn't happen. So thank you for we're, your... We're a great team, and organising so. and, yeah, it's working well. So thank you. then how do you feel about alcohol now? Will you ever drink again, Breeza? Huh, that's a big question, isn't it? It is. Big question. Yeah. Uh, look, I would never say never. Yeah. But I'm sort of, and I know you're the same, May, so I'm sort of like, well, if I start drinking again, I only want to moderate, but what's the point? Mm. <laughs> what's the point then? <laughs> Given that we can't moderate previously. Yeah. So I just think we can moderate now. I just, I just think we're all being fed a big lie throughout. And I know we're going to be talking about marketing and booze down the track, mm. but I just feel like we're being fed a big lie in society. Government gets a lot of money from alcohol, from the tax out. It's billions of dollars to the government. So, of course, they're going to toe the line with this big lie that we're being told about booze. You know, the way people market it, it's a glamorous thing. But in actual fact, it's not. They don't show the single mum on the couch. It's passed out with a packet of Tim Tams, yeah. you know, yeah. from booze. <laughs> They, they don't show, you know, the, the guy who's lost his family because he's alcohol addiction. Yeah. Um, and I've really, I, the lens, I've got such a different lens now and, yeah, it's, it's such a damaging um, thing in our society. Yeah, it really is. It's frightening, isn't it? Like yeah. we, it's poison. It's a drug. It's poison. And, and you know what? I still look at people and I still see people having great time and out with alcohol. And I'm like, you do you. If you can have that great time, then yeah. that's awesome. And I love that you're having a great time. I love that you're singing Johnny Farnham, You're the Voice with your group of friends. I love that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's that line, isn't there? Yeah. And once yeah. that line's crossed, it's a downward spiral. Yeah. It really is. I agree. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, inter- well, I'm so interested to see what this would look like for Breezer if she will dip her toe back in and what that will be like one day. But, yeah, but like you yeah. said, there's um, you're finding it f- difficult to find reasons to drink again. Yeah, and I did think about this, Mason. I'm like, when my kids are, you know, 18, they can drink. I, like, I feel like I would miss drink. I, like that's a whole, that's a ceremony, isn't it, drinking with mm. your kids? Mm. But I'm like... Anything that I can do drunk with them, I can do sober with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You sure can. So I can still dance with them. I can still let's. I can still do sports acro with them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw that. How were those flips the other day? Watch that. I'll post that on Breezy Connection. So I feel like even, even when they're 18, I, you know, will still be able to do everything that I, if I was drunk with them, I can still do it sober with them. Yeah. Love that, mm. mate. Love that. Oh, how are you feeling? Is there anything else you wanted to add? Oh, so I'm open up for the questions before we head into the quiz. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, May. So you've asked some really good questions. And, and this was all, like, I literally only saw your questions this morning before we record the potty. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh. uh, but I think, yeah, having these open conversations and ultimately they're helping people and that makes me feel good. Yeah, too bright. The power in vulnerability. Well yeah. done, mate. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I know a lot of that was difficult to, sh- to share. It's like you ripped off the band. I'd have a bit of a pick at the scab that's under there that's been healing and the wound yeah. is, you know, a little bit open. But, yeah, we really I, appreciate that. I think you. I armoured myself up. Like I did have a little cry this morning thinking of some yes. stuff that I was going to be talking about. But once I'm, I'm game faces on, <laughs> like, <I'm> like, <laughs> I got it out of my system, did my nervous poos and I was, I was fine She's then. To go. She's flying. <laughs> yeah, so well, thank, thank you for making me feel comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get you back on next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quizmaster, test your buzzers, Breezer. Beep, beep. <laughs> oh, beep, beep. We've gone from a squealing pig to a oh, pig. Yeah. I don't know. That just came out. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm excited for this Quizmaster question. I don't know oh, what it is. I'm excited. Oh, right. Well, I've actually thrown a couple together and I've followed your lead. I've kind of copied you. <laughs> no, I actually haven't. All right. We're playing Would You Rather. Okay. All right. Would You Rather. Time or money. Time. Would you rather vision or hearing? Vision. Good. Would you rather knock back AF Margies with Blake Lively or Jada Pinkett Smith? 
Oh, Jada. She's a vibe. Oh, yeah. She's a vibe. <laughs> and this goes with your sort of extreme, um, you love Buddha Sporto. Would you rather be on a broken ski lift or a broken elevator? Ski lift. <laughs> Me too. Give me the views. Yes. Being in that elevator. Oh, hell no. Claustrophobic. <laughs> They're great. They were great questions, they so. say. Well done. Well done. Well, who would you rather, Jada or Blake? Have a day. Yeah, Jada. Jada. I wouldn't yeah. mind knowing a bit more about her, um, Blake's husband, Ryan Reynolds, though. Probably oh, yeah. We'd, we'd muscle. We'd muscle. <laughs> Right in. <laughs> but Jada, I'd really be curious to know about. And did you say time or money? You said time, didn't time. you? Time. Yeah, same. I was actually thinking about, I don't know what made me think of it, Meso, but time is the only thing that everyone's on an even keel with. <laughs> even the rich and famous, they don't have any more time than the poor and needy. It's oh. the most price, priceless thing in the world. Yep. You can't get it back. Can't get it back. Oh, Different. time, hey? Oh, time. Time. <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Breeza, hit us with a text regret. A text regret. <laughs> Have you got one? Well, I was just thinking, Meso, about, <laughs> oh, this is yucky, um, <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> They're never good. Look, when I was single, um, I did go, and this is, I don't know, I feel like this is, a, th- a common thing, maybe. I don't know. Being on dating apps. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking, Tinder? Plenty of fish. Yeah. We, and, you know, I know people that have found love on these apps and mm. there's a place for them and people are on there with in- good intention. Mm-hmm. Some are on with good intention, others not. So, you know, you sort of, you know, you can weasel your way through those ones. Mm. But, um, yeah, just times, I don't have anything specific, but there were times when, you know, I was single and I fired up the old <laughs> Tinder account <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on, a, on a, you know, drinking solo. Yeah. And people say, yeah, people, people, some people say, oh, I'd never drink on your own. But when you're living on your own, oh, you do drink on your own. It's so I'm sorry, fun. But it's you do so drink. Fun. <laughs> so you get busy on your phone. Yeah. No one else to talk to. So you get, you're getting busy. So yeah, there's probably been some regrettable swipes um, <laughs> while on it, Tinder. And can you unswipe? I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. I don't think you can. I mean, maybe it's changed now. Yeah. Um, there's definitely been regrettable conversations. <laughs> um, I was pretty brutal though. Like if someone said, if someone introduced, if someone started a conversation with, hey, babe, Ooh. report, I'd report them straight up. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't talk to me that way, boyfriend. <laughs> like, <laughs> Gone, you're gone, mate. Um, gone. So, so yeah, there was, there was. I know that there was moments where I was in a drunken haze, and I was having conversations online on a dating on dating apps. <laughs> and then you wake up the next day, and they'd message you like, "Who the f is this?" <laughs> and you're like, "Oh no, I was messaging that person." So it didn't result in any IRL experiences in real life, but. <laughs> Yeah, definitely the online antics when I was boozed up were very regretful. <laughs> I think we need to change the segment to online or social media. Social media mess. Social media mess. Social media mess. <laughs> or just on- online ogre or I don't know, something like that. <laughs> but, yeah, it wasn't great. Not great, not ideal. Thank you for sharing, mate. Thank you for listening. It's time for the recommendation of the week. So this reco actually is so relevant to today, Meso, and because if you had asked me, you know, 12 months ago to share my story, and booze related or not booze related, but if you had said, I want you to talk about yourself on a podcast, I'd be like, no, um, I don't do personal stuff. Like, no, I'm a private person. So my recommendation of the week is to tell your story. No, I'm kidding. It's, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it is to put yourself out of your comfort zone. Because yeah. right now I, I'm out. I'm out in the wing. I'm out in the right, <laughs> right hand wing <laughs> on the 50 metre mark. Um, and I am out of my comfort zone. And that's where you grow. In your oh, comfort zone. Love that. Love that. So, and again, I feel like it's a bit of a flex too, that bit of a muscle that you flex. The more you push yourself out, the more the comfort zone, the more comfortable it feels yeah. and the more, yeah, the more you do grow. So that challenge, and actually I've said this in a podcast before, I reckon it was way back in number one potty. Yeah. 
and it sticks with me, the uh, politician Ted Bailey, when I saw him speak in Canberra, he said, do something every day that scares you. Oh, love that. So, so this is my thing. This is, I've done, tick that off for today. <laughs> yes, that's a big one. You can probably have a spell for a few weeks. I was going to say, that gives me a bit of credit, I feel. Yeah. Like. <laughs> so. You're in front. <laughs> so that's me, Meso. Oh, Breeza. Thank Honestly, you. you have been an absolute joy, a gem. You are the driving force. You're the anchor for this whole podcast and this whole Booze Free Biz. We are so lucky to have you flaunting <laughs> AF drinks in the way that you do. It's so nice to be able to say, look at that. I'll, I'll send your page to people to get, you know, reviews and records. Yeah, thank you. Um, but we are helping people. That is a fact. We have been getting that. And it's all because you started it and your journey in your AF world. And I know it's hard to be vulnerable. And we so appreciate you putting yourself out there, getting out of your comfort zone, growing so thank you thank you you and thanks yeah thanks for being on this ride together like we're in it together (laughs) it is pretty sweet (laughs) and i feel like i'm i'm gonna be editing this potty so i might be chopping a lot out no i'm kidding (laughs) (laughs) maybe i should call it my turn (laughs) thanks may so thanks for our chat thanks for listening everybody (laughs) we love you thank you this podcast is proudly produced by our audio engineer, music extraordinaire, Eric Ladd. We love you, Eric.